So this is going to be a bit of a sprawling talk today. Uh, I come from the school of thought that a really good academic talk is one which leaves you learning one specific thing. Uh, today I'm going to sp uh, speak about probably four different things, so take your pick which one. Um, and that's because, as, as Tosca alluded to, uh, I'm kind of writing a trilogy right now. Uh, yes, that's really weird in academia, but it's what's going on. Um, so I'm going to start out the talk today giving you a little background on my book, The Move On Effect, which came out in 2012. That was based on my dissertation research. Uh, I think most of you in the room are political scientists. Is that right? Yes? OK. Uh, so I'm originally a political scientist, now in a comm department. Um, the, so the first book is about US NGOs, uh, and in particular, how the newer generation of NGOs differs from the older generation of NGOs. Uh, I want to talk for a few minutes about that to give you a grounding uh, so that I can then talk about the major findings that are coming out of the book I'm working on now, which is titled Anal Analytic Activism, uh, which is primarily about how uh, this new generation of organizations are using the internet to listen to their supporters in new ways and what they do with that listening. Um, one particular type of listening that comes out of that uh, is the way that the major social petition sites or user-generated petition sites like change.org uh, are engaging people in different types of politics. I have a bunch of data on that, so I'm also going to share data from that. Uh, and I'll be talking a bit about what at the moment I'm calling the new infrastructure of cross-national activism, because I'm bad at giving things titles. Um, that is about the internationalization of this move on style model. Um, I've already written, a, a, wrote a piece last year for The Nation magazine about these international organizations. Since this is a TNGO initiative, I want to talk to you a bit more about that. But I should note, uh, that's a book that's going to come out sometime between 2017 and 2043. Uh, so it's very early research. Um, I'm not sure which of those it'll be closer to, but um, I wouldn't bet against 2043. Um, so yeah, there will be a lot here, and I want to also leave time for us to talk back and forth with each other. So I'm going to try to move fast. Sound good? Just don't talk too fast. Just don't talk too fast. Excellent. Um, so first, just to foreground this a bit, um, I would say that the current trend in scholarship on the internet and politics and the internet in political associations is primarily focused on what we would call organizationless political action. Um, two examples of this come out of Jennifer Earle and Katrina Kimport's 2011 book, Digitally Enabled Social Change, where in particular they talk about uh, online petition sites as petition warehouses. They're sort of neutral spaces where anyone can go and launch a petition and start their own campaign without the benefit of a traditional NGO or advocacy organization. And they use that as evidence of how a lot of the old organizations that we needed in order to engage in collective action aren't as necessary in the current age. Um, we also have the, the recent book, uh, which came out last year by Lance Bennett and Alexandra Segerberg, The Logic of Connective Action, in which they talk about how there's different modalities of action now, where we still see some traditional collective action that requires a mediating organization, but they suggest that we also see a lot of connective action now, uh, in which citizens using Twitter, using Facebook, uh, using petition sites can just create their own protest events without the help of these mediating organizations. And they point out that those protest events have a very different texture than what we're used to. Um, well, I agree that all this is happening. I think that actually it's getting us focused on some of the wrong, uh, some of the wrong objects. Um, what I primarily look at uh, is that I, I think we aren't actually seeing very much organizing without organizations. We're seeing organizing with different organizations. So this is particularly what I'll talk about, to you about in a few slides with the move-on effect that there's a clear generation shift between organizations founded in the past 15 years and organizations that were found, founded before that, what I call legacy organizations. Uh, the more traditional NGOs have different membership models, different fundraising models, and those produce different ways of engaging your supporters in different tactics and strategies. Um, in the past 10, 15 years, it's not that we've stopped using organizations. It's that organizations have started engaging with their supporters in different ways, using digital technology, the, the affordances of digital technologies to engage in these new tactics and strategies. Uh, and I think that that shift has not been very well captured by most of the literature, and so I'm trying to balance things by talking quite a lot about it with you know three books. Um, so what that's leading us to, and what I'll be talking about mostly today, is again that rather than the focus on how disorganized masses are using the internet to speak, you know, hashtag activism, or studying to see hashtag Ferguson and how that's diffusing, uh, 
that we ought to also be paying attention to how organized interests use the internet to listen. We have these NGOs that are now paying attention to social media, paying attention to Facebook, paying attention to what their members click on in order to figure out where they should move and how they should mobilize. And that's often, gone, that's often been left completely misunderstood and unexamined, partially because the data has to be accessed in entirely different manners. That points us to, this should be a three and not a two, new slides, great. Um, that if we are going to focus on this organized listening, it's going to require a different set of tools that I think we're ignoring in this rush towards big data. A lot of the scholarship today, I think, is looking at the new piles of data out there and saying, let's sift through it and see what we can find. Uh, and the real problem that I have with that is that some of the most important trends aren't easily accessible. It's very easy to access Twitter hashtags. It's harder to access things on Facebook. And it's nearly impossible to access back channel conversations happening on Google Groups. Some of the most important transnational NGO work and US national NGO work is happening within Google Groups. And we as the scholarly community are ignoring it because we don't have access to it. That's a mistake and one that I hope we can avoid. Um, so now the move on effect in about seven slides go. Um, again, so first of all, what I'm trying to do, what I tried to do with this book is rather than focusing on specific tactics, those being things like e-petitions uh, or digital platforms, looking at YouTube or Twitter and specifically saying, what effect does this platform have on politics? I focused instead on the organizational layer of politics. The way I get, got to this project was I was on the National Board of Directors of the Sierra Club while I was a graduate student. And so I was noticing this disconnect between how we as the Sierra Club, for those of you who don't know, Sierra Club is the oldest and largest environmental group in the United States. It was founded in 1892. Uh, our founder is on the California Quarter, in fact. Um, so this very old, traditional, large NGO was talking about the internet in a very different way than academics were. Uh, and that seemed like a puzzle for me. And my advisor gently said, well, you've got a puzzle, so go figure that out. Go for it. Um, so the project then became sort of a hybrid project of understanding how these activism professionals were using the internet and how that maps to what we usually talk about as internet activism. Um, the major differences I found weren't about e-petitions versus older petitions. They weren't about face-to-face -face versus online. They were about what I would call membership and fundraising regimes. I'll explain that on the next slide. Um, and this does end up having disruptive implications for existing organizations. Um, it's very easy for an existing organization that was using offline petitions to switch to online petitions. It's very easy for an organization that was doing uh, direct mail fundraising to take their direct mail and just put it in email. That's not particularly disruptive. But when you start engaging members in different ways, when you start fundraising in different ways and the old fundraising streams start to vanish, that's when you get a new generation of organizations and some real problems for the older generation, which is what I describe in the book. Um, I also, in the book, talk about the partisan dynamics. That this happens very differently on the American left and the American right. My plan is not to talk about that today, because that would be five things I'd be talking about instead of four. But if you're curious about the partisan dynamics and what I call the theory of out-party innovation incentives, uh, we'll have two Q&A periods and pick one of those and ask me about it, because I'm happy to opine. Um, also, I blog at a site called Shouting Loudly. So if you're really curious, you can also read blog posts about it. Um, so when I talk about a generational shift at the organizational layer of American politics, these are some of the organizations I'm talking about. And since this is a TNGO group, I added some international groups into the mix. Uh, Avaz.org, which I'll talk about later on, uh, is a move on style organization, actually founded uh, at least half by move on alumni, um, which now has 39 million global members. Um, we'll talk about what membership means to them in just a second. Um, the Open Network is a cluster of move on style organizations in a variety of other countries. I also have a later slide on that. Uh, Daily Coast is a large political blog that now functions as a political advocacy organization. They endorse candidates, they choose, is choose issue priorities, they fundraise for them, they campaign around them. They are an advocacy organization except they've got a lead publisher instead of an executive director. But besides those structural changes, they fill the same niche. Uh, then you have the old Obama team organizing for America, 350.org. Uh, groups like Democracy for America, which is the old Dean campaign, groups like MoveOn.org. So all of these organizations have certain commonalities that set them apart from the organizations that came before them. I would call those, again, primarily uh, membership and fundraising regimes. So by membership regimes, let me pause for a second and ask you to imagine the membership affiliations of a college-aged activist today. Um, 
If you are, and I think you're all grad students in the room, so I'm not going to ask anyone to pretend that they're currently an undergrad. Um, you're an undergrad? Okay, so I'm going to ask you to play this game with me. Uh, are you a member of any organizations? Um, no, but I uh, go to some like college uh, democracy. Okay. Club. So what does it mean to be a member of the democracy club? Ah, that's what the Democracy Club does. But being a member of that, what are the day-to-day, week-to-week things that make you a member? Um, awareness. Do you go to meetings? Not much. <laughs> but they ask you to go to meetings. Yeah. And you're a bad member because you don't go to enough meetings. Go to more meetings. <laughs> so th that's one of the ways that you can be a member. On campuses today, there are clubs. They have meetings. If you go to enough of those, they're going to ask you to be the secretary or the treasurer. Say no. Secretary and Treasurer are suckers bets. I've been Secretary or Treasurer at least a dozen times in my life. It's never a good choice. But that's one type of membership that you have. Um, I would say that there's probably two other types of memberships that you may have. Um, so that's the old school type of membership, showing up to things. You also, either on campus or when you go home for breaks, you probably get mail from some groups that ask you to send them money. Is that right? They also think of you as a member. You don't think of yourself as much as a, uh, uh, as a member of them. But like, if you got on the Amnesty International's list at some point, they are sending you mail saying, hey, please send us a check. Um, if you got onto any environmental organization's uh, list at some point, then all the other environmental organizations are saying, hey, please send us a check. That's a different type of membership. Back in the 70s, we started derisively calling that armchair activism. People who don't show up to meetings, they just write checks, and then they, they call it a day. Up until about 15 years ago, those were the only two types of membership. Now we have a third. Um, at some point, you may have gotten on somebody's email list. Uh, let me check. How many of you get uh, emails from moveon.org? Okay, and how many of you are members of moveon.org? So you're the only one who didn't fail this trick question. You, congratulations, you are all members of moveon.org. In fact, if you pause before deleting their next message, it says very clearly in the first line, dear moveon member. So this is part of what I call the move-on effect. It's the membership regime side of it. Membership is an organizational construct. Organizations get to decide who isn't and is and isn't a member. Yeah. Right. Versus kind of how I think about partisanship and membership and, and how the kind of literature in political science has conceived of membership at least in, in parties. Right. And so here's the key distinction. That's great. Um, I would say that the key distinction is between parties and interest groups or advocacy groups. For parties, since membership comes down to partisan identification, which is something that we can track in surveys, and we actually do track in surveys, I think that's the right definition. For advocacy organizations, membership is much more functional and defined by them. So the members, starting in the 1970s, the members of direct mail organizations often didn't realize that they were considered members. But the organization said, these people who write us checks, we're going to call them members. We're going to run a lot of different tricks to try to get you know, uh, solid, solidary incentives. We're going to send them backpacks and calendars to get them to keep sending us money. And that's because these members writing us checks can let us achieve our mission. So the mission for advocacy organizations is much more constrained than the mission of political parties. Advocacy organizations also aren't in the Constitution and aren't part of the electoral system. We don't get them in every single country. Um, so membership as a concept, I think, is more organizationally derived for these third sector organizations than for political parties. And that's because the role of political parties is pretty immutable, whereas you can very easily just not be a member of organizations at all. There are people who aren't on any organization's list. They don't think they're members. The organization doesn't think there's members. There's no relationship.
But I would say, say that membership, when it's organizationally defined, because the organizations then decide, amongst all these people who are on our list, once you start treating them as members, then you start different, asking different questions about what your members want you to do, which is the listing they'll be getting into. Does that solve that at all or no? That's actually by mail, not by email. So the party organizations will do that, where if you give money to one candidate, they'll sell your name to other candidates. Uh, at least on the left, if you have signed an email for move on, your name doesn't get distributed to the other organizations. That's a pretty hard rule with some strong incentives in it. The organizations don't want to expand their list beyond people who have taken one action. Because if you haven't taken any actions, you're very unlikely to open it which lowers their deliver deliverability rate. And if deliverability is too low, then they get placed into spam folders automatically. And I think for Oxfam, that's the same. Mm -hmm. They have the same policy. Yeah. Um, so the, the standard is that you have to have taken an action with them. Okay. Now, often that action, I move on specifically, their biggest membership growth was around the 2008 election when they said, hey, who wants a free Obama button? So that's a tremendously thin tie, where people said, yeah, I'd like an Obama button or I'd like a bumper sticker. And then move on said, Hey, cool, you're now on our list. Uh, the general rule is also if you haven't taken any actions with them in over a year, then they remove you from their list, again, because of deliverability. Um, so that leads them to define membership as people who have done a thing, even though it's tremendously narrow. Um, that said, this is, this is a tension in the literature. Uh, Bruce Bimber, Andrew Flanagan, and Cynthia Stoll have a wonderful book called Collective Action Organizations where they surveyed the members of moveon.org, of the AARP, and of the American Legion, which are organizations that traditionally AARP is pretty heavily direct mail, MoveOn is obviously email, and the American Legion is pretty heavily face-to-face -face people showing up at uh, American Legion halls and events. Um, and they surveyed people based on uh, what they viewed as their membership styles and their relationships with these organizations. Um, that's membership as defined by the individuals. We as individuals all do get to decide how much do I feel like a member of somebody, how much of something, how much it does, is it part of my identity. Um, and it, that can change over time. As a practical matter and for governance purposes, the organization gets to decide who counts as members. The other reason why I arrive at this de definition is during my time on the Sierra Club board, the sheer number of people who would approach me and say, oh, I'm a member of the Sierra Club. And it would turn out that actually they hadn't gotten any mail from us because they hadn't sent a check in the past five years. So you had a lot of people who thought they were Sierra Club members even though they hadn't sent a check. You had a lot of people who thought they weren't because they had just sent that one check and that didn't mean anything. So while I would say that this is a very thin membership tie, this is also a very thin membership tie. And the old style of membership, campus organizations showing up to meetings, that's something that we used to have throughout American society. Theta Scotch Paul talks about this in her book Diminished Democracy. But that started van vanishing in the late 1960s, early 1970s. So it's been four or five decades since we had the type of civic associations that built strong, thick membership ties. And what the current generation of organizations is displacing is actually the, the direct mail generation that displaced these old civic associations. I saw another hand up in the back. So the, the liking on Facebook is an interesting case. Um, if you unsubscribe, then they count that as you're no longer a member. This is important. I'm, I'm jumping ahead, but let me just presage this a little bit. Um, one of the things that they measure when they send out email actions, they're measuring how many people take action. They're also measuring how many people unsubscribe. And if too many people are unsubscribing, then that's a signal to them that this isn't, isn't something that their membership wants them to do. So again, as an organizationally derived concept, the organizations that have decided people on our email list are members, can then listen to them as members and treat this as a form of what I call passive democratic feedback. If a lot of their members are saying, I don't like that you took this action, I'm going to un un subscribe, and you know, they start by sending it to a subset of their list, if the subset has a lot of unsubscribes, then they'll take that as a signal and say, we shouldn't do this. Or at times, they'll take it as a signal that 
this is unpopular but important, so we're going to do it anyway. Um, I've heard at least anecdotal stories of organizations uh, in other countries who have taken pretty strong like immigration stances, and it'll lead to a lot of unsubscribes, but they'll basically say, you know what, if you're against us on immigration, we didn't really want you in the organization anyway, so let's take those unsubscribes. Um, but the, the point here is actually that that's a measurable. Um, Facebook likes is also a measurable. So right now, I hear a lot of organizations talking about their email list as their membership, and then they also have this contactable universe through Facebook. Um, most organizations aren't currently calling Facebook likes members, and that's because they can't push a message out to them and guarantee that it's sent. About, on average, I think it's about 10% of the people who like a page on Facebook will see any given post from that page. And Facebook is free to change that whenever they want and sometimes charge more money for it. Um, but the, if you're liking them on Facebook and you're not on their email list, then they would consider you in their universe but not necessarily a member. Um, so yeah, my, the point here, uh, mentioning Scotch Paul, is that this change in membership is technologically driven. The rise of, uh, of direct mail membership was also technologically driven, in fact. We had the rise of direct mail membership in the late 60s, early 1970s, as the cost of mainframe computing, you know, having a large database, reduced to around the point where nonprofits could start affordably using big mainframe databases. So you had direct mail relationships between Sears and Roebuck and their customers back in, what, the 19-teens, 1920s. It's not that direct mail was invented in the 60s and 70s, but direct mail used to be costly enough that only a Sears and Roebuck could afford to do it. And as mainframe computing gets cheaper, this option of treating members just as people who will write a check becomes available to organizations. And while all organizations will give lip service to really wanting those deep members, it's also costly, costly and time consuming to organize a federated organization of people who go to meetings a lot uh, and serve as secretaries and treasurers. You're really the problem because you don't go to enough meetings. So they had to give up on you and start just asking for money instead. It's your fault. Um, I'll stop picking on you now since I don't know. What's your name? Victoria. Victoria. I will stop picking on Victoria right now, at least for a little while. Um, so the point here is that we actually had a technologically mediated generation shift, at least in America before. We're seeing another one now. Um, and it's driven by, MoveOn was the first of these organizations that defined members as anyone who was in their database. Uh, we had about a decade where older civil society organizations kind of poo-pooed that. They looked at it and said, those aren't real members. Our people who write us checks occasionally because we knocked on their door and harassed them, those are the real members. Uh, and now a lot of those organizations are quietly redefining membership. Uh, Sierra Club, I used to be on their board, I'm not anymore, but Sierra Club now talks about their two million members and supporters. That's about 500,000 people who write checks and about 1.6 million people who are in their contactable list. I'm actually glad they did that. I argued for that and finally they got around to it. Because um, now that's apples to apples with other organizations like MoveOn. Um, the other point from this, what comes out of this change in membership regimes, is that organizations become sedimentary in character. So the way that you build a large member list is by hooking into some wave of interest as it's going on. So the public gets interested in, say, climate, or a year or two ago we had the, the Red Equal Sign campaign for uh, HRC. Uh, this is Trayvon Martin when, when that controversy was happening. Human rights campaign, sorry. Um, I primarily studied domestic politics, I apologize. Um, or Trayvon Martin in the United States is a nice case. These are things that capture the public attention. During the direct mail era, what we mostly had was single issue nonprofits that would identify a base of people who cared enough about their issue. Defenders of Wildlife is my favorite example. Defenders of Wildlife in the US, it's all about wolves. And they would go out and find people who really cared about wolves. And they'd send them mail saying, hey, please send us money to help protect wolves. And they'd send them updates, here's what we're doing to protect wolves. It's a very simple model of identifying people who strongly enough cared about your issue to send you money. What we're seeing now, since the membership tie is so much slimmer, and what you need is actually people to take one action with you is you get issue generalists instead of issue specialists. So moveon.org, the MoveOn, similar organizations that I'll talk about in a bit, avaz.org, change.org, all of these move with the public agenda. As public attention shifts to an issue area, be it healthcare, be it climate, be it uh, gay rights, they will shift and give people an outlet for, what, for the feelings that they have after watching this on TV. And by giving them an outlet, they are then left after attention recedes they're then left with the sedimentary residue of a member list. This lets them build their 1 million, 2 million, 8 million uh, strong email lists 
that they can then do things with. If at the moment you're thinking, wow, this is so thin and pointless, at the moment it's okay to think that. I'm going to convince you by the end of this talk that there's at least some point to it, I hope. Um, so the point here again is uh, membership has changed from being deeply concentrated to being lightly sedimentary. The other reason why this matters, the other half of what I call the move-on effect is fundraising, the way we raise money. Now again, the older model was essentially you identify members who will write you, say, a $35 check every year in exchange for postcards, uh, or in, in, in exchange for like uh, those mailing label IDs or a calendar or a t-shirt or a hat. Um, and that relationship then generates stable revenue that you can use as an NGO to pursue your goals. That's the main, uh, that's the essence of the relationship. One of the important things of that direct mail relationship is that there's a marginal cost for every additional name. So the reason direct, D Defenders of Wildlife needs to find people who really like wolves is because if they're sending mail to all of you and only five of you really like wolves, every other piece of mail is costing them postage, it's costing them people putting it together, it's costing them uh, the printing. And generally speaking, when they're prospecting for those names, they're actually losing money on the front end. But the idea is to find the five of you who really care about wolves, and over time, your donations make up for what they lost at the front end. So direct mail has actually traditionally been a loss leader. It's been getting worse since people don't pay their bills through the mail anymore. They're now paying them online. Um, and the nice thing about email is that there is zero marginal cost scaling. It costs as much to send your email to 10,000 people as it costs for 100 people. There are some things that go in there, like deliverability, which means you don't want to send to the entire universe, because then you'll get declared spam. But the marginal cost of one additional name is essentially zero. So that incentivizes this generalist activity that we need now see much more of. The other thing it allows them to do is A-B test. Now, let me fact check. How many of you know what A-B testing already is? Two of you. I will explain to the rest of you, because it's very important for everything else I'm going to say. Uh, A-B testing is uh, you randomly subdivide a list of people. Uh, or to use Huffington Post as an example, when you go to the Huffington Post, uh, at first, you are randomly assigned, ba based on your IP address, to one headline or another headline. Those two headlines will be for the same story. But for the first roughly one hour that a story is up on Huffington Post, they'll try out these different headlines, randomly assign people to them. That's A and B. It's a very simple experiment. They watch to see which one gets more clicks. Whichever one gets more clicks becomes the headline at Huffington Post. This is the reason why the headlines at Huffington Post and Politico are so often more ridiculous than the stories themselves because ridiculous headlines that are more controversial than the story generate more clicks. A-B testing also we saw a lot of in the Obama campaign. The Obama campaign actually in 2012 had a large enough list of names that they were doing 12-way A-B tests. They were trying 12 different headlines for the same fundraising email. The difference be between that ends up being extraordinary. The same headlines written by uh, competent email writers, all of whom are professionals working for Obama, one headline in one case would have raised, they estimated, about $200,000. The headline that won, that they actually chose, rose $2.5 million. That's just because of headlines. And again, it's because you get so much email that you're used to deleting. And finding the one that's not going to get deleted so much can matter an awful lot from a revenue generation standpoint. So A-B testing, the larger the list, the more you can then test out what will work. That ends up being very important. And once you have a large list, you can then do that through email. A-B tests were also done in direct mail. They still are. But the time scale of direct mail means that an organization, a nonprofit, will be doing 10 to 12 A-B tests over the course of a year. The Obama campaign can do 10 to 12 A-B tests in the course of an afternoon. And again, that's because of the scale and the speed at which this is operating and the low marginal costs. And that, again, leads to this habit of headline chasing that I mentioned, working on the issues that are present in the media agenda right now and giving people an outlet for them. Uh, which ends up being different from what you would have to do if you're working on the time scale of direct mail or on the time scale of volunteer meetings. Time scale of volunteer meetings is several months, direct mail is several weeks, email is several hours. Um, this is an example of it, but uh, I don't want to spend too much time on the move on effect, so I'm going to ignore it. Uh, this is some of the data that I collected showing that, at, as a matter in practice, uh, I gathered data from older organizations and new organizations, what I call net roots and legacy groups. And then I content analyzed their fundraisers to see what sort of habits they were using in fundraising. And what I found is that the Netroots organizations are doing a tremendous amount of targeted fundraising. They're sending out emails based on what's in the headlines and saying, here's an ad that we want to put on the air right now. Please donate to it. The, the older legacy organizations basically don't do that targeted fundraising. And the core reason for that is if you're doing targeted fundraising, if you're raising money to put a commercial on the air, 
most of that money has to go towards the commercial. That's not a problem for moveon.org because they have about 30 staff and no office space. Uh, if you're the Sierra Club and you have about 500 staff and 51 offices, you have so much overhead and infrastructure that you need general funding. The nice thing about direct mail small donor fundra fundraising was that it was entirely unrestricted. It could be used for keeping the lights on in the Human Resources Department. Legacy organizations, and this is true for transnational groups as well, tend to have uh, much more infrastructure than the newer groups that are rising up now that are defining uh, membership differently. That allows the newer groups to take advantage of the affordances of email in a way that the older groups aren't quite able to do so um, because they've got that, that heft, that ballast, that is both their strength but also something that's harder to pay for. Now, one note I want to make for those of you who study transnational NGOs is that this fundraising change that I call the move-on effect is very present for nonprofits in the United States since they were relying so heavily on small donors writing those $35 checks. Uh, it is less prevalent for organizations that weren't relying on that funding stream. So there are nonprofits within the United States that rely on a half dozen major donors to just give them money every year. There are transnational nonprofits that are relying on government grants or corporate grants or patron donors. Those funding streams aren't changed by the internet in the way that this small donor fund funding stream uh, is changed. So the disruption caused by the move on effect mostly hits organizations that have their funding streams directly disrupted. Um, there are other challenges for organizations that rely heavily on, on foundations. In particular, if you rely heavily on foundations, then you're at the mercy of foundations' whims. And foundation, uh, the internet can often produce shiny objects that foundations now want to chase. Um, so one thing that I've at least noticed and hypothesized around, I have data on it yet, is organizations like Kiva and Kickstarter that allow people to directly fund things um, look very exciting and attractive right now and are therefore a competitor uh, when they go to foundations or major donors and say, hey, you should give us, give us money instead of the organizations you funded for 30 years. That can be very attractive to a foundation or a major donor. And if you're relying just on those funding sources, then the disruption can come when they get distracted and start funding something else. Um, so let me pause now because that's my quick summary of the move-on effect before I move into analytic activism. Uh, any other questions about the regimes that I just talked about? This is a good time to offer additional challenges of, hey, Dave, you're being completely crazy. So I'm about to get even crazier. We're about to go into book two. Only a little bit. So that in particular is uh, Verba Schlossman and Brady have their book. That came out around the same time as mine, so I don't get to deal with it directly. Um, but actually, I, I basically agree with them. If we're talking about mass participation, then this change in organizational type matters very little. And the reason is because the engaged portion of the American public, the uh, part that engages in politics outside of voting and elections, has always been pretty much vanishingly small. We're talking about small enough people, uh, segments of the public that it would usually fit in the margin of error of, of mass polling. Um, so in that context, the way that we're engaging that, ma that participatory public is dramatically changing because we've got different organizations engaging them in different ways. Um, but at least in the move on effect, I'm not finding much engagement of people who weren't already part of that engaged public. So actually, in that sense, it's not, mm -hmm. in the American scene, it's not broadening mm -hmm. civic Right. It's, or if it's in broadening it, it's, it's in pretty slim ways. Now, one change, which is going to be in the second book and which is not on the slides for today, um, we're now seeing some interesting counterexamples coming up because of the social web. So this is actually because of parts of the internet that did not exist when Verba Schlossman and Brady were writing or when I was writing The Move On Effect. Um, Upworthy, I think, is the leading example of that. A uh, show of hands, who's seen Upworthy before, who realizes you have? The rest of you probably have, you just don't realize it. Um, Upworthy.com, which was founded by MoveOn alums, uh, in particular Eli Pariser, who used to be the executive director of MoveOn. Um, Upworthy.com is reaching an audience of between 40 and 80 million Americans per month. That's unique Americans who are visiting it. 
that's larger than CNN, that's larger than the New York Times. Uh, and they are specifically finding politically relevant content and then using A-B testing and analytics in order to figure out what sort of headlines will get people to view this and share it on Facebook. That is then leading, that's not participation, that's not showing up to meetings, that's not writing checks or signing petitions. But that is an engagement of people outside of voting in elections at a much larger scale than we're used to seeing outside of elections. Um, and that's something that's just been happening in the past year. So it's not quite clear what that's going to mean for mass participation yet. But if we assume that mass information, getting informed about political issues, is a necessary precondition for action, we're now starting just in the past two years to see evidence of the mass public actually engaging with political information that they otherwise wouldn't engage with. It's also dramatically different from what we thought was going to happen. We thought we were all going to be in these information cocoons. Liberals would pay attention to liberal things. Conservatives would pay attention to conservative things. The rest of us would pay attention to just funny cat videos. Um, and the assi and this is, there's literature on this saying this is going to be terrible for American democracy because those of us who w didn't want to see political information will not, now not be forced to see it. Turns out that the social web ends up changing that because most of us who weren't in interested in political information, if it's packaged right, still find it to be interesting information. And we've had these real advances in how you package it. So I don't know what that means yet for participation, but it's something new that we didn't expect four years ago. So do you happen to know what a product is in the US? Mm -hmm. the, the base for civic participation has increased as a result, yeah, because let's say in Abbas mm -hmm. has many members outside the US, in fact, mm -hmm. primarily at the yeah. Mm -hmm. right? They're very big in Brazil, yeah. Yeah, so has that done anything to, the, to broadening the base for civic participation? I don't know. Yeah. Um, and part of the reason I don't know is that, again, NGO structures uh, for cross-national NGOs, the types of interest groups that you get or advocacy groups you get is going to be heavily related to the type of electoral system that you have. Um, actually, this gets into some of my next slides. Let me show it. Um, this is just the, the online version of the article that I wrote about the globalization of this type of organization. Uh, so this is called the Open Network, Online Progressive Engagement Network. Uh, it was founded by a guy named Ben Branzell, who is a former Move On staffer, who then spent about five years traveling the globe, helping activists in other countries set up their own Move Ons. Now these are not transnational organizations. Avaz is transnational, it's global membership. These are organizations in Australia, in the United Kingdom, in Germany, uh, who are their, their own national organizations. They're like Move On, they're nationally based focused on national politics, uh, but it's a network of organizations with the same model around the world. The plan with the third book is to do a cross-national study of how these organizations adapt to their different electoral circumstances. So one of the real challenges for a group like GetUp, which is the Australian version of Move On, is when you don't have the, the simple first-past-the-post two-party system like we have in the United States, which I think I can speak for all Americanists in, in, in agreeing, it's a terrible system. It is, it is not a d democratic system that any electoral scholar recommends to any burgeoning democracy to have first past the post in the Senate and the Electoral College. It's silly. Um, but that system encourages a lot of interest groups because the parties become party networks of groups. When you're in Australia and you've got dozens of parties, there's a real question for a group like GetUp, which has a cohesive ideology and several, I think it's three to five percent of the Australian public are members of GetUp and they engage around elections. There's a real question of why aren't you just a party? There's no question of why Move On isn't just a party because then they'd be like a smaller version of the Green Party and they have no interest in doing that. But in countries which don't have our first path the post system, you, the, the style of having a mass base with an ideology looks like a party in a way that it doesn't here. So again, since I think parties and interest groups fill a different gap, that party ID, the way that that doesn't match up very well with Move On just defining, that plays out differently in different or in different countries. Before you go on, um, so two questions. Uh, mm -hmm. I think you mainly talked about politically progressive yes. networks organization, as we call it. Um, what's happening on the in the U.S. still mm -hmm. on the conserv politically conservative side? So I'll give you the, I'll give you the short version since the long version takes at least twenty minutes. Okay. Um, this is what I call out party innovation incentives. What do you call it? Out party innovation incentives. This is a theory not just of what conservatives have been doing with the internet, but generally how technology gets taken up into political campaigns. So at both the party level, uh, we, we hear stories for the past several election cycles, including this one, about how Republicans are trying to catch up with Democrats in, t in electoral technology. Uh, and every time it's this time they're gonna do it, followed by stories that we'll see 
in mid-November about how they didn't quite do it this time, but next time they will. So there is a clear partisan technology gap, both in electoral technology and also in the way that they use the, the internet to build organizations like MoveOn. There have been continuous examples of, of conservative organizations trying to launch the conservative MoveOn, and they will name check it, followed usually about 10 months later by stories of how that attempt at a conservative move on crashed and burned. Well, why is that? So the reason, the, it, the short version is path dependence. Um, path dependence, the types of uh, organizations that you already have influence the types of organizations that you will build. Um, groups like Move On are in a very strong way a response to the single issue groups that in the early 2000s members of Move On felt were failing. Move On was started as a petition to uh, censure Bill Clinton and Move On from the Lewinsky scandal but didn't become a large organization, an organization with a multi-million mass base until the Iraq War, where people were looking for an outlet for their frustrations and felt the Democratic Party doesn't provide it, existing left-wing interest groups don't provide it, so let's go join these various co online coalitions, including Move On. Um, so those focusing events, which mostly appear when you are the party network out of power, uh, prompt the start, the, the launch and success of new organizations. As an example of this from the right, uh, the Tea Party movement was based around taxes being too high. Uh, even though taxes did not change one whit the moment Obama took office, it was the moment Ob Obama took office that the Tea Party movement suddenly took off. That's not because conservatives weren't trying to mobilize during the Bush era. It's because it's a lot harder to mobilize when you're in uh, moments of articulation as opposed to opposition. It's a lot harder to mobilize people to say, let's get the best health care bill possible, which is what Democrats started having to do in 2009, than saying stop the government takeover of healthcare. And that's an easier way to build a mass base. So essentially the theory here is that organizations are constantly trying to form, but it's easier to fundraise, it's easier to gain membership, it's easier to reach a critical mass point where you can succeed as an organization when you're the party network in opposition, when you're out of power. Um, that both explains the rise of move on and similar organizations when they rose, and also the relative success of Tea Party organizations using technology starting in 2009. If we're defining its kind as having this membership definition, yes, absolutely. There are uses of the internet and politics before that, but in terms of digital organizations that mobilize people in this way, yes, absolutely. Across the world, that is to say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and you can see, I mean, like, Avaz is started partially by Move On alumni. <coughs> Pretty much all the other competitors would be ones that are started by Move On alumni in one way, shape, or form. Um, that's the short version about party innovation incentives. There's a lot packed in there, which I don't want to get into that because then it'll be like six things that I'm trying to cover in one talk. Um, so this is the open network. When I talk about the open network, this cross-national set of organizations, it's moveon.org in the United States, it's compact in Germany, lead now in Canada, get up in Australia, 38 degrees in the UK. Uh, these two are not part of the open network, but they're allies of it, Avaz, which is global, and some of us, which is global. Um, and they have startups uh, around the world. The most interesting of those is called Jatka, which is in India which is trying to apply the move on model in a country where people are primarily not accessing the internet via web pages or via email. Um, so they are developing at the moment, they are developing new technologies to figure out how do you modify this underlying model for people who are primarily accessing the internet via SMS text messages. Um, that is a work in project with, or work in progress that I'm slowly studying and hopefully by the time I'm ready to write that third book, really interesting things have happened that we can learn from. Um, right now, I'm sort of in the wait and see mode, and I spend time talking with them, and that's about it. Um, but right now, most of the organizations that have an open style organization are English speaking and part of the former British Commonwealth, uh, with Germany as one Galapagos style uh, exception. There's a story there. If you want it, ask it in Q&A. It's a pretty funny story. Um, the rest of the organizations are all based on that same core model, but it's starting to grow elsewhere. So transnationally, this is not just a US story. This is one with cross-national implications. Oh, so Jatka uh, in India, um, the Indian public is, the, the, the mass public in India isn't using email and it's not going to desktop computers or laptop computers to go to web pages. They're connected through the internet, but they're mostly connected via uh, non-smart cell phones. Um, so they're trying to find ways to apply this email organization model when people have SMS cell phones instead of email addresses. That's what they're experimenting on right now. That's what I meant. Yeah. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, 
So uh, these organizations, uh, short version, all of them have over 1% of their nation's population. That's an important marker because when Scotch Paul did her book, uh, Diminished Democracy, she was focused only on mass organizations that had at least 1% of the US population. Now again, this is based on the move on redefinition of if we have your email address, we're going to call you a member. Um, but they also ask their members to do an awful lot of things. Uh, Lead Now, which is the youngest of them, has 1% of the population. 38 Degrees has 4.2% of the UK population and is viewed as a pretty important player in uh, both policy debates and also in elections. Um, so these are pretty big organizations. Change.org has 79 million members across 196 countries, uh, and Avaz has 39 million members globally. Um, some of us is also a very interesting case. They do corporate campaigns. They are now at, uh, I think, close to 6 million members, actually. Um, it's all corporate campaigns and no boycotts. Uh, for those of us who study corporate campaigning, um, I, I was on a panel about corporate campaigning last year at Midwest Political Science Association, where the entire conversation was about boycotts and boycotts. That conversation is completely out of step with what some of us is doing. They are doing corporate pressure campaigns, many of which work, uh, because corporations care about their reputation, and so they're attacking their reputations and forcing changes without ever saying, and we all in the masses are going to not buy your product. So tactically, it's pretty, a pretty dramatic shift that at the moment, as far as I can tell, has been completely ignored by the literature. If somebody is looking for a dissertation project, go at it, have it. Um, now let me move on from that and actually talk about the second book that I'm writing right now. Sound good? Like I said, I'm covering way too many things in this talk. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to present a work in progress. Um, so the two things that I want to point out about analytic activism, first going back to A-B testing. Um, I would say that there's a fundamental divide in A-B testing. Most of what we're well aware of uh, is what I would call tactical optimization. It's, think of, the, again, the Obama fundraising emails, which I'll, I'll here's a, an example of it. Uh, Sasha Eisenberg in his book, The Victory Lab, about American elections, covered it a lot. Um, but A-B testing, we know, matters an awful lot for raising money online. It matters a lot for figuring out how many people are going to click yes on your, uh, click and sign your petition. That doesn't sound like governance to me. If it sounds like governance to you, then I, you are actually uh, probably even more of a nihilist about this stuff than I am, in fact. That's not governance. That is, an organization has decided what they're planning to do, and now they just want to tweak it and make it optimally efficient. That matters for public mobilization. That matters even for public information in the case of Upworthy. Um, but it doesn't sound like governance. It certainly doesn't sound like democratic feedback. Um, Eisenberg and most people who have talked about A-B testing have only talked about the optimization because they're studying it within the context of American elections. And in American elections, there's very little internal governance questions getting asked because the campaign has a set, well-defined end date and end goal. You know, on the first Tuesday of November, people are going to vote. You want them to vote for your candidate, and you want enough of them to vote for your candidate. Everything else is just about optimizing. That goal is set. When we move to transnational NGOs or US-based NGOs, suddenly we no longer have that fixed, obvious goal. There's an open question, what issues should our NGO work on? Uh, what do our supporters want us to work on? What do our funders want us to work on? And how can we most effectively work on it? Those are much, wide, much wider open governance questions that NGOs have to ask than electoral campaigns have to ask. And since all the research so far has been on electoral campaigns, we've ignored these governance implications that A-B testing and the broader culture of testing has. Um, so I was told by my advisor back in grad school that it's not social science if you don't have a four-box chart. So I have produced my four-box chart. Uh, it's small scale to large scale and tactics versus governance. Um, when you move from small scale to large scale uh, in um, tactical optimization, what you get, uh, I shouldn't say analysts. I should have a different graphic here. Um, what you get is what a colleague of mine, Daniel Kreese, calls computational management. Uh, we actually also saw this with the Obama campaign, that along with the RAB tests, they were also evaluating various different tactics. Should we be sending more mail? Should we be putting commercials on the air? What should we do? And they were using analytics in order to gather data to better decide where they should spend their resources. So on the large scale, this can really affect the, the tactics that a campaign chooses. Setting this aside, though, at, at the governance level, I would argue to you that once organizations have redefined membership to be anybody who's on their, their email list, even though that is a thinner membership relationship, it actually allows them to engage in far more membership communication. Uh, anecdotally, I'll share again, I, I mentioned I was on the Sierra Club board. 
while I was on their board, we cared a lot about what our members thought. And as a result, every two years, we commissioned a survey organization to survey our membership and produce a really thick binder that said confidential on the top of it, which we could read at board members and included their opinions on what issues we should work on. And then we would deliberate around it and we would make some different decisions based on that, uh, the output of that survey. But that was once every two years that we could hear the will of our membership based on a survey that cost us some real money. Um, the Progressive Change Campaign Committee, which is one of these newer Netroots organizations, uh, back when I was on the Sierra Club board, I was meeting with a couple of them, and it was during the, uh, the Gulf oil spill. And they said to me that they were thinking about launching a campaign around the oil spill, and it would be good to partner with the Sierra Club. Did I think Sierra Club would be interested? I said, yeah, they'd probably be interested. We have a committee meeting in a couple weeks. I could get you on the agenda. And they kind of gave me a funny look, and they said, well, we're testing this this afternoon to find out if it's popular with our members. And if it is, we'll be doing it by the end of the day. Now notice that testing is actually listening to their members. If their membership doesn't care about the oil spill and won't take action around it, they won't do that campaign. Um, unless they think it's really important and they think we don't care that people are going to sign off from it. Um, but that form of listening, what issues should we work on right now, is something because analytics provides them with a window and it's a fast window, means that they can incorporate that into their organizational decision making on a day-to-day -day basis in a way that the older organizations couldn't. If you were listening to your membership by having to pick up the phone and call them, or measure their response to mail, or by knocking on their doors, that is inherently slow, which means that there's a lot of listening that you cannot do on a functional level. These new organizations, by creating a thinner membership tie, then are developing a set of ties that they can listen very, very frequently and pretty effectively to their supporters. So that's what I call passive democratic feedback. It's the day-to-day -day inputs from the membership that they evaluate to decide what should we be working on anyway. This also produces new organizational learning routines. Uh, let me skip past this because I want to talk too long. Uh, this is 38 Degrees Office. I visited it a couple summers ago on a quick field visit. Um, in their office in the UK, they have two whiteboards. Uh, this is a terrible photo because I'm not good at taking photos on my iPhone. But what it says here is testing whiteboard. I asked their staff what this testing whiteboard was. And what they said is every week, a team of our staff have a conversation about what we should test. The week I was there, it was, how do we increase active membership by 30%? And so they would have this internal conversation where they'd come up with something worth testing. They would come up with some hypotheses, some things that were worth testing and trying. They would come up with a set of rough metrics. Then they would spend the week trying it out. And at the end of the week, they'd discuss what they learned. Notice, that's an opportunity for them to try out new tactics and strategies and get some inputs that did not exist before. Once you start defining your membership in this very thin, fluid way, that also means that you can measure the will of the membership in ways that you couldn't before. And that creates this, what we call a culture of testing, where they can actually experiment with tactics that they couldn't before. That's driving some of the innovations that we're now seeing. When we see these organizations like Avaz try out novel tactics that sometimes work very well and sometimes don't, it's easy to look at them and say, eh, it's clicktivism, it doesn't mount to anything. But under the surface, they're asking questions like, how can we use this to generate more deeper and more active membership? And they're trying things out on the scale, small scale that they can leverage up, all of which was impossible for the older groups. Yeah? How much information do they have about their membership? Do they know? So in terms of how the mobilization, so, so many end goals of these are about mobilization, right? Mm -hmm. At a baseline level, they have data, individual level data on everything that you've clicked on. Um, if you're turning out to events, then what they will usually do, the standard practice I've seen, is asking people to commit to an event and then sending a follow-up email saying, asking them to rate the event. Uh, not everyone rates the event because it's after the case and they get a lot of email. But if you leave some signature that you went to the event, then they have that in their database too. Um, beyond that, um, in the US, Move On will sometimes uh, compile this stuff and compare it to voter file data. Uh, there's a company called Catalyst that allows organizations to see how their membership lists overlap. Um, they don't have nearly the type of information that the US government or the banks have on people, though. 
Um, and that also varies pretty heavily from different, amongst different countries. One of the challenges that I've seen with the open network is Germany has very, very strict privacy laws. So some of the practices that were invented in the United States can't be done in Germany because they're, they're actually not allowed, I'm pretty sure they're not allowed to keep that individual level data because they're supposed to anonymize it because that's just the law in Germany. So cross-nationally, it also gets a little weird. And that can be tough for the transnational NGOs because where they're based can then affect what sort of practices legally they can do. Um, I don't know, actually. I know that their national office is in New York, um, and I believe they have offices, they have global offices, but I'm not sure where the NGO is registered. That's a very good question. So it might be feasible, it might be possible that it's registered in Azerbaijan? I mean, that there is a, that is either a true or a false statement, and I'm not sure if it's true or false. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> right. I mean, it, it, it's a good question. I, I don't know. So that's something to look into. Um, but I'm going to be looking at a vase for the third book, so that will be one of the first questions that I ask now. Thank you. Um, so the other thing that I want to note here is what I call the analytics floor. Analytics as a set of tools, things like A-B testing, are increasingly valuable as you get a larger list. Um, the joke that I usually tell is that analytics is completely useless to me at my blog. Uh, and it will be completely useless. Uh, some people have joked that I should use analytics to select the title of my book. The reason why I can't use analytics to select the title of my book is because I will not get enough traffic to my book. Not if people, enough people are going to read the thing to get statistically significant findings of any sort. Um, so this is basically, this is King Cohen and Ver Verbo logic. It's the political, I really thought the political scientists in the room would laugh at that joke, damn. Um, King Cohen and Verba told us back in the early 90s in designing social inquiry, that what qualitative scholars like myself should do is enlarge their, the end. We should act more like quantitative scholars, and then we will be doing science. Um, I have some critiques of that, but I won't share it right now. Um, that is the, the core logic for analytics, though, that if you have a list of over a million people, you can run A-B tests on a subset of that list and find something interesting. If you have a list of 100 people, you cannot. And if you have a list of 10 million people, then you can find even narrower and important results. So the large, this creates an incentive for the large organizations. Again, going back to the beginning of this talk, the focus in the literature right now has mostly been on disorganized mass uprisings in protest events. There's no obvious role of analytics there because we're looking at the protest event rather than the protest organizations behind the events. Um, so analytics is invisible when we're looking at protest events specifically. But notice here, this is a real incentive uh, that strengthens the avazas of the world and the 38 degrees of the world over people just starting a Facebook group in order to allow people to engage with each other. Because you can learn and you can engage and you can listen with the, the, these new types of tools only once you have a large established list. So conceptually then, what I call the analytics floor is the th practical threshold below which you can't really effectively use any of these, this listening. All these techniques that I'm going to be describing are ones that you can't use unless you have a big list. So that creates an incentive that a lot of organizations, NGOs, are now following of how can we get a big list. There's a couple routes. One of the big ones, though, uh, is social petitions, working with a company like change.org in order to build your member list. Um, so I I'll talk briefly through this. I, I want to get to Q&A, and I've we've already talked for a long time. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of my social petition data. There's a ton more that I'm just going like, to gloss by. If you're really interested in petitions, we could talk all day. Um, social petitions appear to be a classic case of this connected action. A citizen starts a petition on change.org, a number of other people see it, they sign the petition, news organizations take note and write a story about the petition, the target of the petition, noticing all this public opinion, does something that he or she wouldn't otherwise do, victory. Disorganized, no organization behind it, huzzah, we have connective action. Um, the problem is that if you actually look at the organizations themselves, the organizations that are hosting them, these are not neutral warehouses. They are distinct organizational logics. Um, so I left We the People out, but I've done some writing about We the People, the government site. Uh, it is essentially a digital ghost town 
because it's prevented as a government site from engaging in a lot of the activities, analytics-based activities that these other groups do. But change.org, which is a for-profit company, it sells uh, email addresses, it helps organizations acquire email addresses, particularly in the United States, so they can get above the analytics floor, and then uses that money to fund their organizers and fund their tech development. Um, move on, MoveOn.org, which now also has a social petition site called Move On Petitions, uh, is a nonprofit organization, as I've been dis discussing. And that leads these two organizations that, from the user perspective, are identical. You could go to both these sites this afternoon and start the same petition at both of them. It would be basically the same process you would go through. But your petition would, from that point on, have a very different, markedly different experience. And that's because of what I would call their organizational logics. Um, this is change.org's self-described uh, theory of change. It starts with personal stories that translate in petitions, that translate to signatures, that translates to media, that tra translates to decision makers waking up to the upswelling of public opinion. That leads to negotiation and eventually winning. Notice the important point here is media. What uh, change.org is looking for is personal narratives that will play very well on the Ellen Show or Good Morning America. And there's actually a strong theory of change there, that often when those shows reach the much ma larger public than the public that tunes into the Rachel Maddow show, which is essentially what MoveOn is aiming for, when it reaches that much larger po public, that will then often get decision makers to do something that otherwise they could just ignore and walk away from. So the model with change.org that also enriches the organization is we're going to find personal narratives that will play well in those human interest story areas, and that will both lead to small wins and also improve our brand and bring more people in. That's how they've built in a matter of only a few years. Change.org didn't exist in its current model when I was writing the Move On Effect. That's how it's moved up to 79 million members and still growing. By the time my book comes out, I'm confident it'll be over 100 million members. Um, Move On, meanwhile, switched over to Move On Petitions as a core part of their model six months after I wrote the Move On Effect. I have uh, accused them of doing that just to mess with me. Uh, they have not formally denied that they were doing it just to mess with me. Let's just say that. Um, I'm entirely kidding. That's not why they did it. I'm not that important. Um, but what they did there was the old Move On model was uh, some triggering media event would happen. Uh, their staff would notice the media event and craft some opportunity for supporters to engage. That's signing a petition. That's turning up to events. That's putting an ad on the air. Some initial action. Uh, they would then use A-B testing to refine the action, get it exactly right, tactically optimize. And then they would either leave it at that one action or build it into a larger multi-stage campaign. That was the old model that I described in the move-on effect. The new model has just added a step, and it's a demo democratizing step, actually, which is a triggering media event happens. And instead of the, this core staff of 25, 30 professional activists saying, OK, what are we going to do about it? Instead, the triggering media event happens, and the staff are charged with watching their social petition site to see how supporters react. So you, the Move On members, whether you realize it or not, if you are an engaged member, you may watch uh, the news about Sandy Hook and say, you know, we really got to do something about gun violence in America. I'm going to start a petition. And Move On sends out emails to their members saying, hey, every month they send out an email saying, hey, if you have any ideas for a petition, please start one. So they encourage you to do that. And then the staff watch that and monitor which petitions are particularly popular. And they then use those to leverage coach refine tactics uh, and then they move on to the A-B testing and the building into larger campaigns. So they've inserted social petitions, user-generated petitions, as an early input so that their members have a stronger voice in deciding what move on will work on. Rather than just passively clicking on a campaign or not clicking on a campaign, they're now asking their supporters to actually come up with the initial tactics and the initial topics. So what that, what that tells you is that social petitions, user-generated petitions, are being used as, in a very different role by these two organizations. Um, I spent six months last year gathering data, the top 10 petitions at both of the websites, and running content analysis to see what topics are they on, who are they targeted at, who's starting them, are they associated with an organization, uh, and how many signatures do they get. Uh, over the course of that six months, there were 269 distinct petitions that appeared on the top 10 list at MoveOn, 283 at change.org, so about the same number, roughly. Um, what surprised me was the dramatic differences that I then found when I did the content analysis. In the course of those six months, only six petitions, so about one petition per month, was even on the same topic. Those topics included pressuring uh, Jay-Z to end his partnership with Barney's New York 
after there was a story that came out about Barney's following around black customers all the time. Um, so there's a pressure campaign that showed up on both sites. Uh, Greenpeace actually uh, started petitions at both sites when they were urging the Russian government to release some activists who were in jail. Uh, there was a case at East, East Side Catholic School, which I think is in uh, Washington State. A vice president, a uh, principal had been fired for being gay. A uh, petition was started at both sites for that. Um, George Zimmerman was going to be in a celebrity boxing match. That was a terrible idea. So petitions appeared on both sites about that. Um, and there was a bill in Arizona, uh, which was an a anti-LGBT LGBT bill, caused a media storm. And that showed up on both of them. Um, then the, the last one was when Duck Dynasty was initially uh, not taken off the air, but their lead uh, character was suspended. There was a petition on change.org saying, bring him back. And the next day, somebody at Move On said, are you kidding me? Keep him off the air. So you had dueling petitions. Besides those six individual cases, if you were visiting change.org versus Move On and monitoring politics through their top 10 petitions, you were living in entirely different universes. It's not just that they weren't doing the exact same cases. They weren't talking about the same topics at all. So this is my, my far too narrow topic classification scheme. I know you can't read this graph. But the big findings is that change.org was constantly doing petitions on things like animal rights. Sometimes this was an animal rights campaign trying to end factory farming. But most of the time, it was like an individual dog that had been beaten. And they were saying, the person who owned that dog should be sent to jail. Here's a petition to send them to jail. That's an individual heartfelt story. I love dogs, so I'd feel sorry about those stories. But it's not usually what I would uh, consider to be the, the subject of American politics writ large. Um, move on petitions were mostly about guns. They were mostly, mostly about health care. Um, they were mostly about fracking and global warming. They were about the big issues that you would usually call progressive issue areas. Those topics didn't appear at all at change.org, except for healthcare. And in the case of healthcare, change.org healthcare petitions were all, here's an individual dying of cancer. Please release a, an, uh, uh, make an exemption to give this individual a life-saving experimental drug. There was never any healthcare petitions on change.org that were about Obamacare or about the change in the overall healthcare system. You're saying that change.org never frames an issue as, right. as... The collective frame is always absent from change.org. And that's because as an organization, their model is, let's get a heartfelt, non-political story that will play well on The Ellen Show on Good Morning America. And the theory of change there is that that will lead to all these small wins that will help people believe that change is possible. But in order to do that, what they are excluding is what we would traditionally call American politics. I did a pilot version of this study in mid-October, which happened to be during the week of the government shutdown. I think it was six out of the 10 top petitions that move on were dealing with the launch of Obamacare or the government shutdown. Uh, about one half of one of the petitions at change.org dealt with it at all. There was one petition that was about release a cancer, a cancer drug that also said, and also let's end the government shutdown. Besides that, change.org change that week was focusing, I think the top petition for a while was a high school girl who was uh, suspended because she had been caught drunk driving when really she was the designated driver. And it was calling on the principal to allow her back into school. Now, I think we can all say, like, yeah, it's, a, it's terrible if you get suspended when you shouldn't be suspended in high school. But during the week of the government shutdown, would any of us in this room say that that is the top issue in American politics? So that distinction is tremendously present. If you were to launch that same petition on both sites, change.org would elevate it to number one. Moveon.org would ignore it. And that, again, is because of their organizational logics, that one of them has a model of trying to promote these personal stories that they can get small wins and also get their name out there more. And the other one is promoting a model of essentially using this as an input into their traditional nonprofit political campaigns. Um, I also looked at the targets of the petitions. Uh, Move on tended to be state and local legislative petitions and some national petitions. Uh, Change.org was almost all corporate petitions. And the valence of these corporate petitions were, was overwhelmingly positive. It's usually asking a corporation for an exemption or to be an ally. To, a couple of them were actually consumer petitions saying, hey, we really love this thing. Please bring it back. There was even one number one petition, which was about uh, The Family Guy, the television show. Do any of you watch The Family Guy and remember when the dog was killed last year? So the number one petition at change.org for a little while was urging the creator of Family Guy to bring the cartoon dog back to life. Now, we brought the cartoon dog back, I think, two episodes later which Change.org did actually call a win. 
Uh, it turns out that was already scripted, and he, he afterwards said, ha ha, of course I wasn't going to kill the dog. I don't watch the show. But that's for a while what they considered to be the top issue in American politics. That is not what, change, what Move On would ever work on. Yeah. I have a question. How much input do the petitioners have over the organizers of those platforms? For example, people can create a petition. They can um, just disseminate the, the link to the petition and make their friends sign it and then get it further. So how much power do they have over? Well, the more you get your friends to sign it, what they would call organic growth, the more likely it is that in their back-end dashboard platforms, your petition will pop up as one that is hot. And the ones that are hot, that do well early on, are the ones that they then invest organizer time on. That's true for both sites. Um, MoveOn has a pretty cool system. When you first launch a petition, they send out an email to members, uh, a, a small set of members that says, should MoveOn work on this petition? And if you say yes, then you can say yes by signing it. If you say no, then you can also write them a few, a few notes about why you think this is not progressive or not a good issue for them. And the staff then monitor that and decide whether or not they should promote it. So that helps them weed out things that, like if a conservative started a petition on, change, on moveon.org, uh, which was you know, anti-immigration, and then got all their fellow conservatives to sign it, it would immediately get caught and, and moved out of it. Whereas change.org, like with the Duck Dynasty thing, would be happy to promote it. Um, so you have that sort of agency to do better than other people by working hard at the front end, and that can then invite organizer support. But the organizers at change.org are also looking for that personal story. So if a, uh, a collective action petition around global warming did really well because Greenpeace said, let's get everybody to sign it, it's very possible that they still wouldn't promote it because it's not the personal narrative that they tend to look for in their campaigns. Um, two more slides and then we'll finish with Q&A because I've been talking, I think, for way too long. Um, the petition creators at change.org on their top 10 list are almost never organizationally sponsored people. It's always these individuals with a heartfelt story. Interestingly, at MoveOn, even though MoveOn is itself an NGO, the majority of the petitions started were from people who are from other NGOs. And that's because the way that MoveOn uses its system is now when a partner organization comes to them and says, hey, will you work with us on this issue? Their auto automatic response is, sure, start a petition on it and let's see if it's popular with the membership. So they have ally organizations who are starting these petitions. And if those petitions do well, then they can get sent out to the full MoveOn membership, which can then lead the other organizations to build a mar larger member list. So this is now a way that nonprofits are engaging with each other in the nonprofit side, not on the, the corporate side. Um, the other element of this is change.org. This is a log scale. gets far more signatures. If we're measuring just by signatures, then change.org's mo model is better. They are getting tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands more signatures than, change than moveon.org petitions. But the reason for that is because of the petitions that they are, that they are putting out there for people. So to close, what I want to note here, again, this is all about how we get past the analytics floor so we can engage in advocacy beyond just petition signatures. Like I said, I'm doing like four or five things in this talk. I apologize for that. Um, Change.org is producing these huge petition signatures, but it's only around a particular style of story. This looks like spontaneous citizen campaigning, but it's actually a, it's actually a very sophisticated, analytics-informed business plan. There's organizations there in the things that look like they're just spontaneous. We have to look at them in different ways. Move On is getting fewer petition signatures, but it's around the prominent political issues of the day. It's the core Move On model with more and earlier inputs from their supporters. So what looks to us like clicktivism, just a bunch of people signing petitions, is the first step in this longer term plan to build grassroots power for them and for their allied organizations. Um, oop, that went back. Um, the last point I want to make, I think I've already said all this, but I want to again note Studying digital NGOs, none of this stuff would be apparent to me if I wasn't interviewing the organizations themselves. The tools that we use to study digital organizations are really going to affect the types of things that we find. Those of us who are finding only clicktivism, that tends to be because we're only looking at how many petitions get signed or how many hashtags are uh, being promulgated. Uh, those of us who are finding that it's all spontaneous uh, political events, it's because we're just looking at the political events and not finding all the back channel work and all the analytics. Analytics does not leave a digital footprint the way hashtags leave, leave digital footprints. So if we're only looking at the easy to access digital signals, then we miss all this activity that's happening behind the scenes. I personally think that this activity behind the scenes, which is still organizational in character, is far more important if we want to understand the scope and context of uh, NGOs in America and in the world. So I want to end by encouraging you to use those sort of 
old school methods of interviews and of observations, of actual field work, because that's where we're going to pick on a lot, up on a lot of what's going on online uh, by actually going offline and talking to people doing it. So now, yeah. questions. for getting emails and buttons. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if they're positioning themselves as platforms to create real change, mm -hmm. um, I guess how successful do you see them as doing that kind of themselves? And then do you see there being any sort of backlash to it? Because if they do kind of work within this media cycle, mm -hmm. then if the topic changes every week or every day or every hour sometimes, like how... And there's already like backlash, like full disclosure, I worked at Facebook, so mm -hmm. like on pages specifically, and like Upworthy was specifically targeted because of their style mm -hmm. of headline generating and, and clickbaiting. Right. And like Facebook and those organizations have the power to change the newsfeed formula to say what is allowed and what isn't. And so right. you see this sort of like kind of when everything's important, nothing's important, mm -hmm. watering down these tactics and like a backlash before you can see like the real change. Yeah. Um, three levels of answer, because that's, that's a very good question, but it's got layers to it. Yeah. Um, in terms of the effectiveness of these organizations, I would rate them as being more effective at the margins than the organizations that came before them, but we're talking about very small margins there. Um, the trick as somebody who studies advocacy and interest groups, um, the trick is we've never actually had good metrics of success for advocacy or interest groups. Ne like, never. Go back to Jack Walker, 1991, Actually just getting what is the denominator population was hard enough that we never really did it very well. Um, so since measuring success of individual organizations or individual tactics has always been so hard to do, I don't, and I'm doing descriptive work, I don't have a way of saying, yes, this is more powerful. Um, I do see an awful lot of active work going on as they themselves try to assess their impact and assess ways to become more impactful. But largely, what the, the real challenge here, like if we look at change.org, change.org can genuinely boast that they, have, they are behind tens of thousands of victories. Um, it's true, but it's because they tend to be small victories. So one of the reasons why success is so hard to measure is that the bigger and more important your topic, the harder it is go going to be to succeed. You know, we can look at the climate movement and say, wow, they keep on failing at these international climate negotiations. Um, and one answer to that is, well, I guess they're, they're, they're failures. And another answer is, yeah, that's because that's really, really hard. Um, so uh, I've described this a couple times as an importance meter. That organiza the, the challenge actually with analytics, I didn't even get to the downsides of analytics. That's a whole other chapter of the book. Um, it's going to be a very big book. Um, the downsides of analytics is that they, it can force us to focus, or it can lead us to focus on the things that are most popular rather than the things that are most important. Um, when we're quantifying our audiences in this way, we need to be careful about the things that get left out of the quantification. Um, so, yeah, on the success level, I think that ends up complicating things. Uh, I think that these new NGOs are about as successful, maybe slightly more successful than some of the ones that came before. Um, but they're facing the same challenges that have always made it hard for NGOs to accomplish their goals. It's still hard. That wasn't going to change, and it isn't changing. Um, the other thing that I think you pointed to is email exhaust, or in general, the exhaust within any tactic. Um, that is definitely happening. If you have built in a culture of testing, though, then it can help a lot. So one of the interesting things that I heard from a couple people at Upworthy, is that Jeff? Um, I think I know the guy who was just staring at the door. Um, uh, so one of the things that can happen uh, that I, I heard from Upworthy is you know, they had that um, clickbaity headline for quite a while, you know, you'll never believe what happened. Um, and people pointed out, like, oh, everyone's getting re uh, exhausted by it. Everybody's trying it, so it's not going to work as well. Since they rely on analytics in their headlines, what happened is as their readers got exhausted of that, they were testing other things, and so they started getting different headlines. If you've built in these practices of testing, then as people get exhausted of one thing, uh, you can switch to the next thing by testing and seeing what works. Uh, generally, you've got a local maxima problem that it's very hard to know what things shouldn't we, should we be testing for rather, rather than just A and B. So that's where you need other forms of human intelligence and other forms of listening. Um, but in general, while there's worries about email exhaust, there's worries about exhausting any of these channels, if you've built in the habits of testing, then you're pretty well situated to deal with it. 
that again is an, an advantage for the large groups over the small groups. The small groups can listen to what the other, the large groups have found in tests and then emulate it. But if you can't task yourself, then you can't uh, reap the advantage of being the first to do it. There's a long answer for you. Somebody else needs to use the room. So oh. uh, there was no other last urgent question. Then thank you very much. Thank you. You, you all have been a, a very supportive audience of this very long talk. So thank you.